Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 235 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. Hey. What's happening, Barb? How are you down in sunny, warm Florida? Fan-a-fantastic. Yeah, the day that we are recording this, Indiana had its first way-too-cold-for-me morning, woke up to a brisk 42 degrees. Oh my god, already? Yeah. Yeah. It only gets that high all winter here. (laughs) (laughs) You're probably still in the 90s, I take it? Yeah, and we are eyeballing uh, the first storm that might hit uh, the west coast of Florida since 2018. I'm a storm watcher, and so... It's uh, just forming down south of Cuba, and it's forecast to come ashore of Tampa. But I've lived here my whole life, and that's probably going to change at least 25 times. But, you know, they're already talking about school shutting down, and it's time to get gas and go get water, and, you know, everybody's starting to panic. So that's what we're doing in this neck of the woods. You're cold, and we're stressed. (laughs) Are you going out to buy 13 loaves of bread you'll never eat? No, no. I normally just grab a couple things of water and make sure I have gas. But where the hell are you going to go? If a hurricane comes in, I'm not going to leave. So it's just it's just mayhem. Stores are already low on water and it's not supposed to hit till Wednesday and it hasn't even formed and it's not even a hurricane. <laughs> There's the weather from my neck of the woods, partner. Well, OK, uh, it's just chilly. I uh, kind of feel bad even mentioning that now. <laughs> yeah, I've been waiting for a storm knock on wood. Hold on. To hit my area my whole life so it still hasn't happened and i pray it doesn't but yes that's what we're doing wow and here i am trying to get sympathy for the hoodie i have to wear yeah <laughs> that happens when you live in the north <laughs> well i hope you weather through this storm no pun intended no thank pun you intended. i will hey this weekend lab day east for all of oh, those yeah. that are not gonna be in the storm's path and happen to be in Terrytown, new york For this weekend, on October 1st, I'm going to be speaking with my good friends Preet in the, and I did not name this room, the Sleepy Hollow Room. Nice. Yeah, I don't know what. So that means you're going to bore them? I think that means I'm going to take my head off and throw it at people. (laughs) I don't know how that works. But I'll be there October 1st at 3.15 in the afternoon. So if you're going to be at Lab Day East, come and see me. I'll have a link to register for my talk I'm doing called A Couple of Studs at the Bar. Right. Are you going to be there? No, I will not. You're not going to make it. Okay, good. Good. So it'll be barbless, so all the fun will happen. All the fun will not happen, but that's fine. So y'all? Y'all? We're all in for a treat for this episode. Heck yeah, we are. Barbie, have you ever heard of zirconia? Yes. Of course our whole industry has heard of zirconia. But if you thought you knew what zirconia was... Prepare yourself to find out that you had no idea what Zirconia is about. Zero. This was a great episode, though. Love it. With all the dental lab shows that I've gone to, I used to run into a technician named Jay Immersion. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Good job. Who was always at the Zubler USA booth showing off his Zirconia that he didn't need to stain. Now, while I found this idea incredibly intriguing... Jay said the best way to explain it on the podcast was also to have Rella Christensen on the show with him. Last name might sound familiar Christensen. to those in the dental yeah. industry. Rella yes. just happens to be the nerdier half of her famous husband and dentist. I say nerdier because Rella has been studying the different zirconias in the mouth and has some fascinating results. But... I warn you, she uses some big words to explain it. Big words. I got lost a few times. I didn't. No, you're smarter than me. (laughs) I could barely keep up, actually. But I'm sure our audience is, I'm sure our, but I'm sure our audience, ah, that's hard to say, (laughs) but I'm sure our audience is a lot smarter than I am. Rella talks about the additives in zirconia, what causes them to fail or not fail, and what we are learning as more and more of these restorations are being placed in the mouth. 
Of course, Jay talks about the technical side of working with zirconia and how he's able to get a great looking crown by saving time by polishing it. Get this? Pre centered. It's very interesting. So join us as we chat with Jay Immersion and Dr. Rella Christensen. Have you unlocked your dental laboratory's potential through 3D printing? Well, with the Asiga, you can. Did you know Asiga has over 500 validated materials on their open material system? And it's growing every day? By harnessing Asiga's proprietary layer monitoring technology with its smart positioning system and its integrated internal radiometer, as a laboratory, you'll be able to produce any indication you desire. It doesn't care if you models, splints, temporaries, or heck, even permanent crowns. Your investment will be future-proof with the Sega's rugged engineering, providing you with a fast, accurate, and repeatable machine with a reputation that is time-tested in the dental laboratory industry. If you'd like to learn more about the Sega's machine or the material offerings, please visit the website at asiga.com. That's A-S-I-G-A dot com. Or contact your favorite dental reseller. And we appreciate your support of the podcast, Asiga. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. Barb and I are super excited today to welcome an interesting dynamic to today's podcast. We have Jay Immersion, who uh, joins us. You're in the Florida area, right? I'm in South Carolina. South Carolina. I knew that. Yes. So we got Jay Immersion, and joining us with him is Rella Christensen. How is everybody today? Really good. good. Very good. Awesome. So let's kind of explain how this came together. Jay, known you for a while, we run into each other at shows all the time. Yep. And you came up to me and you said, I got this really interesting way to get zirconia so you don't have to stain it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is very, very exciting. It's done more in the green state. We're going to get all into that. Yeah. But you said that Rella, or is it Dr. Christensen? Well, uh, the PhD stands for phony dentist, you know. Uh, (laughs) uh, Basically, I'm not a dentist. Uh, I have a PhD in physiology and microbiology and work in dental caries and restorative materials. They just call me Rella, though. The real Dr. Christensen is my husband. (laughs) Sure. Oh, yeah. Everybody in the industry is aware of him. Oh, yeah. But we thought we'd talk to the better half today. That's right. Well, at least to the nerdy half. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you two connect? I'm going to see if she remembers. I met (laughs) up in in Massachusetts. Uh, I was giving a program up there. And I just found him to be very enthusiastic and very talented. And he owned horses. And that combination, I just couldn't resist. (laughs) Brains and horses. Is that your, uh, is that your vice? <laughs> I invited her over after the seminar, I invited her over to the, to the lab and the barn and we spent, God, I think it was, you were over till about 10 o'clock. It was late. And we just saw the horses and saw the lab and did some talk about dentistry. It was a, it was a great night. So you just connected, huh? And then we lost contact for a little while. Jay moved took the horses with him. And uh, basically, I don't know how we reconnected the second time, but I will tell you that we have been searching for the concept that he has. And, and I know we'll get into that. It, how did we connect the second time, Jay? I can't so remember. I have to be honest. Um, I didn't want to bother you. I, I know that sounds crazy <laughs> because, you know, I'm just a lowly lab technician and you're Rella Christensen. So uh, yeah, I just I, I didn't want to be a bother when Katrina and I bought our mill and I started doing this process. You were the first person that I thought of. So I had your number. So I sent you a message. There we go. And here we are. You're on a podcast <laughs> talking about this. That's great. <laughs> Let's do a brief kind of how you got where you are today. 
Rella, I would love to hear your story and how you became associated with dentistry, but not a dentist. I started in dentistry 100 years ago, (laughs) went to USC and did a bachelor's degree in dental hygiene and also studied dental technology. And uh, met uh, the man who became my husband there, Gordon Christensen, and we married and and worked as a team, well, for years, right up to this day. But I went back to school in my 40s and and took a double major PhD. Wow. And I was really mostly interested in microbiology of dental caries, but this led to restorative materials because we're looking for restorative materials today today that we call therapeutic materials. That means they restore form, function, and aesthetics, and they also do something to treat the oral cavity to try to prevent further dental caries. And there's a lot of that coming out. We got interested in uh, zirconia because we were looking at it as a framework to carry materials that we could infuse into it. What we wanted to do is we wanted to actually uh, veneer the linguals of teeth, would you believe that? And (laughs) and, uh, deliver therapeutic materials to control people's uh, oral cavities. Uh, Honestly, Elvis, we have found over the years that we can't control their habits. Uh, People think they can, but habits and choices, uh, lots and lots of sugar in our diets, lots and lots of soda, low pH, high sugar, lots of use of chemicals that cause the saliva to diminish. And in that kind of a situation, uh, we have just lots and lots of caries. And then, of course, uh, very few people practice really the kind of oral hygiene that's that's needed on a long-term basis. uh, to try to control the, the diet and the chemicals. Uh, I'm talking about common chemicals, uh, both prescription as well as uh, street drugs and marijuana. There, there are about 300 uh, chemicals that actually uh, decrease saliva. So uh, this is how we got into zirconia, and I knew Jim Glidewell, and we were actually working with uh, an aluminum oxide product, Wolseram. I don't know if you remember that one. And I do. And, um, I remember Wolseram. <laughs> Did you? Uh, Glidewell was uh, big into it, or, or or planning on getting big into it at the time that it started a study. But unfortunately, that study was posterior three unit bridges, where a molar had to be the ponic, so they were pushed back in the oral cavity where they had plenty of stress and Wolseram just couldn't survive under those conditions and asked the question. uh, We were working with several brand new zirconias, this is back in 2004, as substructures and asked the question, why do these have to be substructures? Could could they be uh, the actual entire crown, a monolithic uh, restoration? And there were people in Italy and other places uh, Uh, asking the same questions, and the rest is kind of history, isn't it? Uh, 2009 on, uh, we have had ever-growing, ongoing study of any zirconia that we find that it has a substantially different formulation or way of manufacturing the discs. From that, I can tell you what we're learning uh, from that study uh, that led us to J. Back in school, you started the study of zirconia? or I don't understand when the research started. We started the study of zirconia in 2004 as a substructure material. And I wasn't in school. By then, I was long out of school. I did my PhD and received it uh, in 1985. And so here we are at 2004. We knew the people that were developing zirconia for the oral cavity through our work. Uh, You know, we've had this research institute studying products from all over the world since 1975. 
Wow. And all you do is research dental materials. And yes, some of the materials uh, cross over anything we do in infection control, masks, gloves, disinfectants, uh, sterilizers, that sort of thing carries over into veterinary and nursing and oh, wow. medicine wow. and so on. But really, our knowledge area and, and our area of interest is dentistry. So uh, I think what you said is a true statement. We started in 2009. When Bruxer was introduced, we were the first to actually put it in a clinical study. There was a lot of concern about posing dentition and mm -hmm. because of the high structural strength. <laughs> uh, yes, there is still is. And I'll tell you, we are finding some problems with some of the formulations, uh, but uh, we'll get to that. But at any rate, um, this was a 100% tetragonal phase zirconia, or what the industry refers to as 3Y, LT, low translucent, yeah. full strength, but the correct name is tetragonal zirconia. And tetragonal. this was 100%, uh, yes, tetragonal, that's a weird word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> E-R-A-G-O-N-A-L. It is the correct term for 100% tetragonal phase, as you probably have talked about with others on your podcast, uh, zirconia moves through phases and it does that even at room temperature. And once you get it to this tetragonal phase, it needs to be uh, stabilized uh, in some way to stay there. And uh, this is where the yttrium oxide comes in, uh, uh, where you get the three Y, that actually stands for three mole percent yttrium oxide, which is used to stabilize the zirconia in its strongest uh, state. But uh, at that level, I think everyone probably remembers that the original Bruxer was launched in the fall of 2009. It was uh, what, what has become known as a 3Y or, or full strength zirconia or LT. But the correct name again is tetragonal, spelled T-E-T-R-A-G-O-N-A-L. And that is contrasted with the cubic containing zirconia where more and more and more of the yttrium oxide, the Y, has been added to the point where when we're up at 5Y, we're 50% cubic phase by that time and 50% tetragonal. So you can see that becomes a, what I refer to as a hybrid product. Interesting. And in the 4Y, we've got about 75% tetragonal, 25% cubic phase. And of course, there are formulations out there that exceed 5Y or 5 mole percent yttrium oxide. And this is, this is, I think, really what we need to talk about because uh, I call it the great silent shift, and it started about 2014 when the competition realized that Glidewell uh, was uh, selling an awful lot of Bruxer. By that time, we we noticed no no real problems uh, with it as far as opposing dentition, as far as loosening the teeth during function, mm -hmm. and all of. That, that were predicted, those really didn't happen with that particular formulation of zirconia. And so logically, from a marketing standpoint, the competition aimed at the weakness of the original Bruxer, which was lack of translucence. And yeah. that started, in my personal opinion, a downhill run. As they've manufactured different types of zirconias and made them more translucent, that's where the morphine of it is coming in? It gets much more complicated than that today. About 2014, we had the additional yttrium oxide added to gain translucence. But I think most laboratory technicians realize that there are a number of additives to zirconia. And as we move up to today, uh, from 2014 to 2022, now we're starting to get additional additives, which are trying very hard for the one-fits-all zirconia that's going to have the 
incredible longevity clinically of the original Bruxer and the 100% tetragonal phase formulations, but they also want the increased uh, uh, translucence. So now we've got more and different types of additives. Uh, they're referred to as docents. And we have two products under study. I think it's appropriate to say that the first problem that we've noticed with these additives are that they lower both the flexural strength and the fracture toughness. Uh, with the 5Y zirconia, we lose about half the strength. And what we've noticed in these long-term clinical studies, bear in mind this has been going continuously, clinical study that's now turned into a huge study with including 110 dentists from 37 states, uh, 18 different formulations started the study, 11 are still on the market now. The others have been taken off the market for various reasons. Uh, the study includes 20 labs. Uh, those labs are chosen by the companies wow. selling the brands that we're studying. And we have identified seven clinical situations where the loss of strength has made a difference and we're seeing fracture failure. And uh, we'll probably carry on this uh, monitoring for up to 10 years. Uh, we've already monitored... Uh, Bruxer now for 13 years, 2009 up to present. So um, that is one of the problems we've seen fracture failure in virtually all the brands that are cubic containing or have these extra additives to try to make the one size fits all type of a, uh, a situation. We today would strongly recommend that the labs and the dentists uh, stick to the 100% tetragonal phase of zirconia from molars, where translucence is not a first priority except for some uh, people. And if the patient wants it, great. They just need to know that there may be some problems starting at about four or five years with fracture or chipping. Posterior multi-units. Any time that we have uh, an under-reduced uh, preparation and, and the zirconia gets thin uh, in the crown, and, and this can happen quite commonly on uh, tipped second molars where you really have a difficult time getting the reduction you'd like occlusally, or abusive occlusion uh, where occlusal adjustment is, is going to be needed from time to time. Uh, uh, the doc has no idea how thin he's getting, he, he or she is getting, as they grind uh, on, the, uh, on the occlusal of the, of the crown, and it can get very thin. Situations uh, where endo-entry is expected, some of these you're, you're not sure the tooth is going to calm down, and cubic containing zirconia doesn't like being ground on for an endo-entry. Oh, no. We all know that all second molars should be gold anyway. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> High risk lifestyle, you know, people in sports and so on. Uh, uh, some of them will even opt for a uh, hundred percent tetragonal on anterior teeth. They love them white and you know, they're getting hit in the face, uh, that type of thing. Or, or frankly, whenever maximum longevity is wanted by the patient. Uh, we, we believe on our own site here of, of being quite honest with the patient that, look, uh, there are several options if you want a white restoration. And zirconia is one of those options. And with several different formulations, we can either have maximum longevity or maximum aesthetics. What's important to you? Can't have both. So may I ask you a thickness question? So in your studies, can you share with the technicians out there listening, what is this thin or how thin is too thin? Like what's the threshold there from when the fractures start in four to five years you know, when we've had these fractures, uh, we do get back pieces of the crowns. And if thinness is the problem that's caused it, it's usually very thin. Okay. And uh, I think it's fair to say that zirconia as a category of dental material 
has actually served very well. I think that we are abusing it by adding too many additives. And I think that uh, your question, what are these situations? I named about seven situations where really uh, tetragonals or conia should very seriously be considered. You know, molars, posterior multi-units, minimal preps, abuse of occlusion, endo-entry, high-risk lifestyle, or if the patient expects the restoration to last uh, till they die and they're not 100 years old already. So you asked about thickness. For the tetragonal zirconia, we have had no fractures in 13 years of Bruxer. And we find that very amazing because at the time that we entered this product into the study, Glidewell Laboratories uh, was advertising it as something that would tolerate a gold casting prep. I remember that. Now, I don't know what that means to people, but to us, that means a minimal reduction, maybe Mm -hmm. 0.6 on the occlusal, and it it can get down to uh, what Glidewell described as knife edge margins. The dentists that uh, placed the original Bruxer 2009 did not use life knife edge margin. So they used a, a slight chamfer to show the lab where they wanted the margin. Mm-hmm. But um, as far as uh, occlusal reduction, it was like about 0.6. Yeah, that's about what we get a lot of times for, for those materials. And see, that's, but... that, that's tetragonal, if you mm-hmm. get that, yeah. because the cubic yeah. containing will not tolerate that. If there's any unexpected uh, challenge to it clinically, you know, something the patient's eating or a blow to the face or any number of things that patients can do that that you're just, you can't predict. In 13 years, out of all your study, none of the Bruxers broke or fractured? We find that amazing. Uh, Yeah, I do too. And it continues. And it continues. In fact, uh, we have at various scientific reports and lectures and so on shown several cases where we were able to actually photograph by scanning electron microscopy what we have come to be known as a low temperature degradation where little pieces will pop out under high stress areas. And what we've seen clinically in dentistry uh, is this is going to be a crown opposing zirconia. So number one, zirconia opposing zirconia. Number two, you can look for facets. And if there are facets, over a period of time, you finally see little uh, shaded places. And under scanning electron microscopy, we can see that these uh, are places where material, the actual uh, zirconia, little tiny pieces are popping out. And we've been monitoring several cases uh, of this now for 10 years, but the crowns continue to serve. It doesn't crack. And this is the transformation toughening that you hear about uh, with zirconia. When it forms a defect, it expands about 4 to 5%. Mm-hmm. And this, this causes the cracks to be, should we say, pinched off. They don't propagate. And as I say, we've been watching these cases now in several different brands. Uh, Zircat LT, the Bruxer, and Full Strength, uh, Zirconia. And they, they they just keep serving. So I think this is one of the reasons we've seen no fracture. If we were using, for instance, a glass ceramic and had a similar looking defect, uh, the crown would, would eventually break into a couple of pieces. So even with the all the additives and it weakening the strength, is it still stronger than lithium desilicate or a PFM? Or? Definitely. Uh, now, PFM, are we talking about just the veneer ceramic or are we talking about the metal substructure? Well, yeah, it's, you're not going to break the metal substructure. I'm talking about porcelain shear. Well, it off. can be broken if the connectors aren't designed just drive you you'd be, sure be, sure, you know. sure 
It's amazing that you can add all those additives and it still be stronger than what was on the market before. There are additives in 100% tetragonal fade as well, but in very, very small amounts. And they're placed there to give it various physical properties. But it's it's kind of getting out of control in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> However, there are places you want translucence. Certainly in the anterior part of the oral cavity. Bear in mind, our work is all in molars. So we have the maximum uh, stresses uh, and, and stresses that are entirely different, really, than, than the anterior part of the oral oh, cavity. Oh, absolutely. But for the anterior part of the oral cavity, what we're noticing is the cubic containing formulations that get close to 5Y or 5 mole percent uh, yttrium oxide added and above, they are causing large, deep concave facets. And the glaze used on them further increases this this kind of wear. They, the glazes have greatly improved and they're tending to stay with the, with the crown as opposed to 2009 when the glazes really didn't, didn't adhere to the zirconia just for yeah. really months. But now they tend to stay. Several of the brands work very, very well there, but they are more abrasive on that kind of a surface. And uh, we're looking at these deep concave facets. And for laboratory technicians and dentists, let's look at what would happen clinically. A warning here. This type of zirconia that has maximum translucence would be more likely to be used on anterior teeth. And if you have some people that have several to many years of experience with PFM, you may be able to remember that there's a whole generation of people where oral cavity was restored with PFM, but not the lower anteriors. And what happened to the lower anteriors, Elvis and Barb? They got shorter. They could get really <laughs> short, couldn't they? Yeah. So they wore them away. We need to watch that with our high yttrium oxide uh, zirconias. That's interesting. Certainly an occlusal guard would be uh, in order, but lots of patients won't wear them. You can consider crowning or veneering those lower anteriors in zirconia. Mm -hmm. uh, zirconia, posing zirconia, we found uh, does very nicely. And you'd also want to monitor the occlusion regularly because teeth move and things change. Uh, but uh, we, we definitely don't like to see these uh, concave or scooped facets. Facets should be flat. <laughs> sure. So, Jay, did you know any of this before you met Rella? <laughs> I've learned quite a bit from her. I imagine. I did know some, but not to the extent that she does. I mean, she's been doing research for 13 years on it. And yeah. not just any old research. It's quite extensive research, which is uh, it's well, amazing. Well, let me tell you learned. how we do it, uh, Jay and, and, and everybody, <laughs> be, because it, it is pretty darned interesting. We... We've developed a method over time. Bear in mind, we've been doing these kinds of studies almost 50 years. And what we do is we make a, a polyvinyl silicone impression of the quadrant with the test tooth and the opposing dentition. And then uh, those are poured in alpha dye, a polyurethane material. We don't use uh, but just a smidgen of the filler hardly any. Uh, we throw away great bottles of filler with that stuff. <laughs> and um, those dyes are very, very smooth. We, we can't use stone. We, we need something else. Uh, we don't recommend this as a dye material because it does have a, a little higher shrinkage uh, than you'd want to tolerate for margin fit. But we then sputter these dyes with a, a pure gold, very, very thin covering and these dyes become a permanent record of what that test crown and the opposing dentition look like. And we make those every year. The patient is recalled yearly, and those are then trimmed and uh, mounted uh, on a, a base year after year after year. And we can do scanning electron microscopy uh, on those types of dyes. 
cross out the scanning electron microscope, which is a whole nother topic, and look just at the dyes, we can put them under a, a microscope at, say, about, uh, about 10x, and you can see virtually everything uh, with the gold sputtering. It makes it possible that they're very high resolution, and you see exactly what happens, when it happens, and how it progresses and we, we have closets full of these dyes. We've actually characterized uh, about 250 white materials from around the world over the last about 45 years, comparing all kinds of ceramics and unique formulations, uh, and zirconia being one of them. But you can see you line up these dyes, and, and it's kind of a slam dunk. You see exactly what's happening to that crown, and exactly what it's doing to the opposing dentition. The clinicians uh, uh, provide a clinical photograph of everything so we know exactly what the opposing dentition is and where it is. And so we can monitor the abrasion uh, uh, occurring or the wear occurring on silver amalgam, on, on various uh, uh, formulations of metal, um, on other ceramics, on enamel, what, whatever, whatever naturally opposes this part of the study. So you can see it. it I'm not really smart. I, I'm just uh, <laughs> ambitious. <laughs> I, I can't believe she just said that. <laughs> I can't even understand half the words you're talking about, Rella. I think oh, you're pretty, I'm sorry. Pretty smart. No, you're fine. It's me, not you. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I've got a question related to your last statement. So you're monitoring the crown as well as the opposing dentition. Are you also getting an x-ray every single time so you can look at what, what's happening in the bone and the, and the roots and the tissue? And No, we haven't got an x-ray every single time. We do have x-rays at initial and usually when we complete the recall, which is anywhere from five to ten years or when the material is no longer commercially available. Interesting. As you can guess, it's a, a lot of work and a lot of effort to do this. We are not paid for these studies. Wow. We sponsor our own work and we share with the companies. For instance, approach a company or they may approach us to study a material if we can see it's different in some way from what we've already been collecting data on. They then choose the labs, two of them, in case one of them doesn't work out well. Uh, so there are two labs. They, they do not generally know each other. They can be in quite diverse parts of the U.S., but we, we do ask that they be in the U.S. because it's been hard to ship things back and forth across borders. Sure. But they have to be commercial labs. They can't be the in-house labs in, in the company facilities. And basically, the companies choose the labs, provide the labs with everything that they need, uh, and make whatever arrangements they make with them. We then provide the dentists and the patients and blind everything. The labs do know when it's one of our cases coming through because we use our own prescription form, and it, it clearly has the name of our lab, Track Research, on it. And uh, we want them to know that this is a this is a study restoration, but they they catch on really quickly because there are no dentists and no patient names on it. It's just a bunch of letters and numbers, uh, a coded way to to submit these to the labs. The docs don't know the labs. The labs don't know the patients or the dentists. Uh, hmm. And nice. uh, the the crowns come back to us. When they reach here, we measure their thickness all over and photograph the interior and exterior and immediately send them on to the dentist. Everything happens the same day. The crown arrives here, it's sent on to the dentist, everything by overnight, and uh, the dentist places it and then collects the data, the impressions, the photographs, fills out a, a grading form that is computerized and standardized for statisticians. Hmm. And we grade about 18 different characteristics of the crown every single year. Wow. Do they all use the same cement? They do. We ask the companies supplying the material to choose the cement. And so we now have data on about 
nine different cements from three different cement categories. And, and I, I wasn't really going to get into that today, but we can tell you that the least D bonds are from resin modified glass ionomer 1% versus 5%. Oh yeah. Uh, hey, good that's tip. Not surprising. Yeah. That's a statistical significant uh, uh, number there. Uh, there is one resin cement, a self-adhesive resin that has had no D bonds in six years and that is Panavia SA Cement Plus. But other than that, the resins really aren't competing well with the resin modified glass on where we have two brands, the Rely X Looting from 3M and Evolve uh, from GC. Interesting. Nice. Companies pick the cement and they also write the step-by-step -step of how they want the crown side to of the restoration to be handled and how they want the tooth side step by step and provide the products and they also provide and choose their own finishing and polishing and provide the step by step directions uh, for those as well and they actually buy them and send them to us we we don't go out and buy them they they send us a big box with all those materials uh, we feel that 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 makes the study more fair. Yeah. I've got a question for all those technicians out there. I think I know the answer, but do the companies recommend that you do or do not sandblast before you cement? That depends on the companies. And, and some really? want you to sandblast, yes. And others don't want it. They're, they're using a, a chemistry, you know, instead of sandblasting. And uh, I don't know what they tell the labs, you know, a lot of, a lot of this uh, would go on on the lab side, but as you know, when the crown is tried in, you get saliva and gunk all over it, and you want to clean it again before you uh, start your cementation. So it varies. We follow their directions to the letter. Wow, that's surprising. If something happens that, that isn't good, we feel like they need to have had the opportunity to make that decision. Yeah, I agree. I was just curious. I think most labs sandblast, don't they? Especially after glazing. I think most labs do. The question is, should the dock sandblast? Mm. Oh. See, that a lot of docks will have a, you know, a chair side sandblaster. And I, I would say most have something like that. And uh, that becomes uh, another question. After they've tried the crown in to clean the internal, what are they going to do? And the companies do specify that as part of their cementation uh, step by step. Hmm. All right, Jay, what do you do? <laughs> well, well, see, Jay, Jay, he oh, hi guys. is going to try, to try to take up the challenge. And we use tetragonal, 100% tetragonal phase zirconia. Can it be finished and characterized and omit the glaze? Yes. And make the restoration blend with surrounding dentition. Yes. And keep it fast and easy and priced competitively. Now, now yes. I think that's a huge challenge. And, and that's where Jay and I started communicating. So how did it come up, Jay? I mean, did she approach you with the question or were you already working on this idea? I knew she was always looking for that. Yeah. I just didn't have the tools in the lab to do it. And a few years ago when we bought our mill, I love trying new things. And I have a lot of different burrs that I try out and I just tried a whole bunch of stuff on. One of the things that fascinated me the most was working in the green state. I never had that opportunity because I was always outsourcing my teeth oh, and they'd come you. back yep. to me centered. So I started working in the green state and I just started trying all these different burrs and I've now completely eliminated all of my posterior staining glaze. I do not stain and glaze anything in the posterior anymore. Are you polishing? I am, but the problem with polished zirconia, it's not really a problem, but it looks very synthetic, very pearl looking yeah, yeah, when yeah. you high polish yeah. it. And it's very labor intensive to do that right. It takes a while, but if you polish with the burrs that I've come up with in the green state, you can, I've timed myself. I did 20 crowns and it averaged out to be one extra minute in the green state but I've gained so much more time on the back end, not having to stain and glaze. So how do you polish chalk? <laughs> I've got some polishers that I tried out. Um, I'm actually working with a company named Zubler USA, and, and we've come up with this kit. 
And this green state polishing kit allows you to not only pre-polish the green zirconia, but also take down your marginal offset at the same time. That's important because, you know, we're talking about grinding on zirconia or post-processing zirconia. And if you thin out your margins, you know, after it's been sintered, you run the risk of fracturing. Oh, yeah. That's a big no-no. Yep. It, but most labs do. If they want oh, to take down do. that marginal <laughs> offset, well, you don't have to do that anymore. With the same burr that you polish the axial walls and occlusion with, you can take down your marginal offset, and it only takes one extra minute. So you're using a diamond, so you're not introducing mm. anything to that top layer of zirconia that's going to get in there while it's centering? And, and... Correct. Nothing gets in. Gotcha. And you can do this for both pre-shaded zirconia and, you know, infiltrated zirconia dipped white. So it comes out of the mill, you cut it out of the disc, and you spend a, only a minute. So you take your pins down, obviously. Yep. Uh, I like to put a little bit of anatomy in with a high speed. Uh, that actually is included in the kit. And then uh, after that, I, I use a series of flexible wheels. You'll see them if you go on the the website. It's Everything's there. Yep. And I, I polish the axial walls, polish the occlusion, turn down the marginal offset, and, uh, and then it's ready for color. But if you had pre-shaded, you could go directly to the final polishing step, and then it goes right into the centering oven. How do you keep from polishing too much and you lose all your contact? Because you're doing it so much bigger, you know, you don't have that check. Under a microscope, you'll look at a crown that's been milled. And regardless of how good your milling strategies are, you're still going to see some type of surface that the mill created. Part of the surface we want to take off because it's very abrasive. What my wife has done, she's my designer, Katrina. Yep. Yep. You've met her. Uh -huh. We've come up with a, a solution to just increase our distance to neighbor by a, a, a slight amount. And the, everything's working out perfectly. So in the design state, you just you just increase your distance to neighbor in your software just a just a hair. Interesting. So you do actually get into the design and make adjustments to the workflow. Yes. To do this. Interesting. Yes, but it's it's very minimal, um, and and usually it's only on distal extended teeth, uh, when you only have one say mesial contact. When you have you know the two distal and mesial contacts, nine times out of ten your path of insertion is going to dictate you have to basically take that contact down to get it to fit in the mouth. Now, it would be different in, in a modelist crown, but I want my crowns to go in and the doctors not touch them. Oh, absolutely. That's a whole other topic. I mean, I was talking with numerous doctors and they take their contacts, a lot of them do with, with a, a fine diamond, and then they leave it. And and we all know, I mean, the the if you're talking about a proximal contact and, and that, that tooth is in a socket surrounded by ligaments and it's floating with movement it's just going to start grinding and and sanding things down if it's not if the finish if the surface finish is not treated properly it could be really bad for the mouth yeah do you have to tweak the centering hold times or the way that it centers when you not at it? all okay nope not everything is normal as always wow so when I was in the lab, I remember that we used to have an issue with if you wanted a certain shade, you would use a pre-shaded puck that was lighter so they could stain it to the shade that we want. How do you handle things like that? Or do you only get the shade the puck is, uh, assuming you're not dipping? I'm dipping. Yeah, so you're dipping. So you can create any shade you want. I can. Prior to that. But if you're doing pre-shaded, you're only getting the true shade that puck is made out of. So let's let's go back a little bit and think... I, I said I've eliminated all of my posterior staining glaze. So what I've done is in order to get that shade just right in the anterior, I will put a little bit of stain on the labial surface just to try to get that match and get it perfect. I will leave the linguals alone because, again, that's contact. Yeah. Yeah. So you find that it works better on zirconia that's dipped and colored. Not pretty. necessarily. N no, okay. it, it works just as well on, on both. And have we run these things through studies? Are we seeing less fractures? I have not. Rella, have you put any of these in and took them under study? Or? We've gone so far as to place several of them. It's hardly a study number. What, maybe three, two, something like this? We did like two this. of them, yeah. Uh, okay. And what I was interested in is would the surface stay? It, it, it's a very lovely satin surface. And it, it blends really well in the oral cavity. And I was wondering, uh, would 
would the color change over time? Would the surface stay very smooth like that? I really haven't seen anything like it before. We've been talking about polishing zirconia for years. As you know, there's there's all kinds of both laboratory and clinical information out to trying to encourage polishing rather than glazing. Yeah. This makes it doable. Well, you know, everything has turned to fast and easy. And <laughs> it, yep. it's really hard to get away from that. And I'm not blaming anyone because I'll tell you, it seems like all concerned, industry, labs, dentists, first and foremost, they want this fast and easy. And it, it's really hard to, to move off of that once you get a lot of people uh, kind of buying into that idea. This process is, it's, it is fast and it is easy. And it, it gives such a much better product for the patient. Because, I mean, I think a lot of people forget that's why we're here. Well, see, for us, we were the ones that said, Jay, can you do this on 100% tetragonal phase zirconia or 3Y zirconia? And this was what it was done in. And uh, it was done in a zirconia that we happen to know is a particularly low particle size zirconia. And Jay, you can tell them the exact brand uh, mm -hmm. of it. It is one that uses the keboidal method. In other words, the pucks are, are almost cast, so to speak. Hmm. They're not isostatically pressed. They're colloidal. That's right. Yep. And, and the original Bruxer was made that way too. This, as far as I know, this method I don't know if it originated, but I know that both Glidewell and the company selling this called B&B, &B, they mm -hmm. both had at least consulting with a Dr. Moon, M-O-O-N, Dr. Moon. Well, I don't know if that's how he spells his name. That's how I say it. <laughs> I've, never, I've never met Dr. Moon, but I know that he has been a consultant to both of those labs. And we did see that process uh, in occurring on the early Bruxer, and I believe that Glidewell now uses that process only for their Bruxer full strength. The other uh, products that are also called Bruxer do not use that particular method. I think it's almost like making a slip casting. Did, did, did you, have you ever done one of those, Elvis? I don't recognize the term, but... Well, I think you were telling me that's a lot how old ceramic plates were made. Yes, like it, it was China. a method uh, originated, I believe, in France, where it's a different technology and, it, and it's quite a technique sensitive process. I've never performed it myself, so uh, I can't really tell you step by step how it mm -hmm. occurs, but it's more of a casting of the ceramic in, into a, a shape and, and then, if I can say, sucking the moisture out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm in order to make it dense and, and in order to hold it all together. There's no binder needed because it's... No, it's no binder. Casted. Exactly. Uh-huh. Some of the uh, master ceramists, uh, particularly European, would use this uh, this method. Very interesting. What was this product called, uh, Jay? What, it's was Origin it Live. So B there you go. I, it, yeah, yeah it's, it's, okay. it's called Origin Live. It's by B I knew Origin, but I didn't know what... what mm -hmm. Because there are a whole bunch of origins, aren't there? Yes, there's oh, yeah. Beyond oh, yeah. Plus. They a, yes, they have a line. bunch. They have a bunch of stuff. Yeah, they're origin. Why is the three Y or the one hundred percent tetragonal? Yes, and they don't. I, Steve at B and D is a friend of mine, and he was telling me that they actually don't have pre shaded in live anymore. I guess it just wasn't as popular. That's what I use, and it, it's a great material. They have a process where they refine their zirconia particles down to almost a smoke size and then they then they cast it so that if you look at electron microscope images of their material it has a very fine grain size it does hmm. that and these are very very high magnification uh, uh, electron uh, microscope uh, images uh, I believe I don't know if they do them on site or if they get them done at the University of Utah but the, particles, yeah, it's at the university. Yeah, particle size and particle size distribution. This is one of the really important things about zirconia. 
uh, so that it's dense and it's homogeneous. And they're putting out a really, really nice product. They're a good company too. <laughs> they're good people. Is it a sign for us technicians out there that are running laboratories that when that megapascal strength goes down, that's when there's more additives in it? You know, that's, that's a very good question, Barb. That has been the case with the addition of the yttrium oxide. As that has increased, uh, it has definitely decreased the physical properties, which would be both your three-point bending test or what they call flexural strength type test. There, there's another method to a uh, biaxial, but, uh, and they're all acceptable, but it, it is where you're placing a sample under stress like this, you get a flexural strength. Right. And as you know, for, for the uh, 100% tetragonal, that, that's generally going to be around a thousand or so plus or minus. Right. And uh, as you get into like a, a five wide, that'll be just about half. And, and there are zirconias uh, that go above that. In fact, we've taken issue with that point, we feel that both the labs and the dentists need to know how much yttrium oxide has been added and, and yeah. what category. There is such a thing as an international ceramic classification. And in that international ceramic classification, it takes in the, if we started uh, with the strongest, it would be called a class five tetragonal zirconia, then it would go to a class four, and that would be uh, your cubic containing zirconia. Those are the names. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to a class three, and there's your glass ceramics. And then it goes down to a two and a one, and the two uh, would be the um, felspathic types of ceramics, and the one, the class one is actually a uh, your veneering, ceramics, uh, that type of thing. Makes sense. And so they, it goes from strength. Uh, with If we look at veneering ceramics, it, like even two-digit numbers clear up, to, clear up to four digits. And there are a lot of material scientist people that maybe wouldn't agree with me, but I feel like if you add something to a very strong formulation and it decreases the physical properties... Uh, both flexural strength and fracture toughness, I would call that a contaminant. But yeah. of course, we, we don't use that word. We yeah. just Oh, that's a bad word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's not a contaminant in that it makes it dangerous to the patient and right. something like that. It's impeding what product could do, and it's a trade-off. That, that's the most fair way to describe it. You, mm -hmm. you gain translucence, but you give up strength and our study shows that that means you give up longevity we don't we don't talk about fracture toughness enough i think that that should be talked about a lot more with instead of how strong in megapascals flexural strength things are well the reason they don't talk about it jay is for ceramics that is generally a single digit number yes it is one yep for the strongest of the if the tetragonal zirconies, it's going to be about five. Uh, somebody that's really stretching it might claim a six, but goes down from there. And when you put it in ad that you have a this wonderful zirconia and it has a fracture toughness of five, nobody knows how to interpret that. The, the clinicians or the yeah. patients, or I mean, I think it's easy enough to interpret it. It, it goes from practically zero fracture toughness in some of the uh, the ceramics uh, on up to about five, uh, if you exaggerate, maybe six. But if we took something like maybe metals that, that bend, uh, I mean, there, there are things where you could put a little flaw in it and then stress it. That's what a fractured toughness test it is. You, yeah. Flaw is placed in your sample and then you put it under stress and, and see uh, what amount of stress is needed in order to... Uh, uh, to cause it to fracture, some things would just bend. They, they wouldn't actually fracture, and they would have a very high fracture toughness number. This is some fascinating stuff. I think I learned a lot more about zirconia than I thought I was going to learn about zirconia today. <laughs> well, probably more than you wanted to know, right? <laughs> probably. 
I loved it. I think it's interesting. It's all get out. I learned a lot. One quick question for a quick answer, Rella. If you had to get a posterior crown today, what would you get? I would get, um, I'm going to be quite specific. I would. Get, <laughs> Somehow I don't doubt that. <laughs> I would get an origin live with Jay's finishing. Oh, there you nice. go. That's a compliment, Jay. <laughs> Thank <Wow>. you. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, it, it is beautiful. Important unknown is we don't know how it's going to last in a lot of different oral cavities. You know, that's the beauty of a practice-based study. You have a lot of different dentists, some more yep. innately skilled than others, some more careful than others. And you have all these patients, uh, all different ages and genders and lifestyles. and A lot of variables. Various foods that they eat and other things they put in their oral cavity to, to destroy the dentistry. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we need now with, uh, with this finishing method. We know what happens if something is glazed. Interestingly, the, the higher flexural strength, lower yttrium oxide doesn't cause these huge concave facets, anything like the cubic containing, the high cubic containing products. It has to be something in these products. So, Somebody that knows a lot more about zirconia than I do has suggested it may be the grain size. Somebody knows more about zirconia than you do? <laughs> oh, lots of people. Lots and lots of people, let me tell you. And they know a heck of a lot more, too. These are, these are people with PhDs in zirconia and ceramics. Wow. It's amazing. And that's not wow. me. <laughs> I can tell you what happens, but somebody else is going to have to figure out why. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have them on sometime to get even deeper into zirconia. Rella, Jay, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're welcome. Well, thank you for having thank me. Thank you. That was yeah, awesome. Yeah, that was some great stuff. I think we're teaching the industry a lot what we don't think of when we just choose a zirconia and grind away, fire it, stain it, send it out the door. We should be thinking about this stuff. And we should have a part two. You don't have to stain it anymore. Yep. That's pretty amazing, man. <laughs> yeah. that's, yep. that's some cool stuff. That's a, that's a whole step we get to take out to save a lot of time. It does save a lot of time. It has. Well, thanks again, everybody. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Whitmix is thrilled to announce their most recent addition to their milling product line, introducing the DWX 53DC from DG Shape. This powerful mill satisfies your need for speed. Three reasons to consider this mill one, it has three times the gripping power for PMMA, two, it mills 30% faster, and three, the integrated webcam allows you to monitor a milling project from anywhere on any device. Head over to tinyurl.com slash Mill. That's the word tiny, the letters U-R-L dot com forward slash Whitmix, R-O-L-A-N-D, mill. Or head over to this episode's show notes for a link. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. And I'd like to say a huge thanks to Jay and Rella for coming on our podcast. I super enjoyed nerding out over zirconia. I can tell you that. And I can tell that dental material is a pretty passionate subject for both of them. Who would have thought, Elvis, that so much went into a little white crown that so many of us take for granted? So check out this episode's show notes for a link for the burrs that Jay was talking about. And I hate to tell you, buddy... But Rella was not using that big of words. I understood everything perfectly. Uh, ooh la la, Miss Smarty Pants. I know. It's interesting what all of the companies are doing to make a better looking crown, though. While not taking into account the compromise they might be making with the material. So, will we see problems in the years to come? I don't know. Only time will tell. Thanks, you guys. All right, everybody. Hope to see you at Lab Day East. And if not, we will talk to you next week. Bye. Wow, I'm really not prepared here. <laughs> <laughs>
October 1st. Yes. 